Well, good evening, everybody. It's been a while. Um, you know, I was supposed to be, we're going we're gonna, to, by the way, we're going to close out the series Designed by God. And I was supposed to be the E for experiences, which is what I'm going to talk about tonight. And, uh, but Pastor Heather Moore was your uh, guest speaker on the 19th of September. She was awesome, by the way, wasn't she? Psalm 23. So uh, we're going to put E, the experiences portion, at the end of it. So I'd ask uh, Michaela to make a modified slide called Designed by God. You see that? So if you're dyslexic, it looks awesome. But I love midweek. I'm so glad to be back. You know, um, I'm in school right now, to, uh, now at Pacrim Christian University, and my class just happens to be on Wednesday night, and I miss midweek, but I get to get my fix online. So hello to everybody who's on the online church right now joining us online. We want to welcome you. But, you know, there's amazing teachers and speakers throughout this series besides our normal teaching team of Pastor JB, John Burgess, and Pastor John Tilton, Pastor Richard Y. Ale Ale, and the other guest speakers. But what I really enjoyed, if you remember with me in the summer, was Dr. Randy Furushima. Remember him? Yeah, he's, yeah. He, he took you through the book of Daniel, and chapter by chapter in very great detail. He's an awesome prophetic speaker. It almost sounds like I'm kind of gushing, yeah, like I have a man crush, but no, I have an explanation for this in just a little bit. So let's talk about experiences. You know, just your being here tonight is an experience in itself. So Pastor Wayne asks us this question. It's printed on your notes, and I'm going to have it on the screen together. Let me read it for you. I'm not going to do my Pastor Wayne voice, by the way. <laughs> Your past experiences are important considerations in finding your design. What tasks or projects in the past influenced you over the years? What have you learned from them? You know, experience is defined in the dictionary as this. Practical contact with an observation of facts or events. Like, really? So let's talk about it in plain English. Write it in your notes on the top. Experience is simply Stuff that happens to you. Turn to the person next to you and say, stuff that happens to you. Okay, if you're, if you're from Kalihi, like I am living in Kalihi right now, you can modify that and say, stuff that happen to you. Okay. Anybody from Kalihi? Oh, yeah, represent. All right. So the stuff that happens to you, these experiences, how does it fit into God's design for you for ministry? There's a, saying that, there's a saying out there that you are the sum total of all of your experiences. But let's see what God has to say about experiences. It's right there in your notes, Romans 9, verse, sorry, Romans 8, verse 28. Let's read it together. Ready? Go. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, notice and underline the word all things. Turn to the person next to you and say, all things. So now that we know in this, in this scripture that Paul writes, we know that God uses and works through all things. And in all things, all experiences, all the stuff that happens to you and me, God intends it for good, for his good, and, to, and for those who love and fear him, and to draw people closer to him. If you forget everything tonight, just remember this. Each of you has a story, your experiences. And your story matters to God. And for those of you who are willing to be open and transparent before the Lord, God can use that story, God can use your experience to reach others, to become real in their lives and draw people to Him. Amen? Everyone has a story. Your story matters to God. And God can use your story to reach others for him. Experiences can be summed up in four different ways. And for, tonight's, for the sake of tonight's design, I'm going to just make it real quick. First is, right in your blank, painful experiences. Painful experiences. Somebody say amen. amen. Often, that's the, often when we talk about experiences, that's the first thing we want to talk about. Painful experiences. Many of us came to church and came to Jesus through such painful experiences, right? Let me read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 for you. It's kind of long. 
God wonderfully comforts and strengthens us in our hardships and trials. And why does he do this? So that when others are troubled, needing our sympathy and encouragement, we can pass on to them the same help and comfort God has given us. You know, there's no one here tonight that has not been through, is going through, or will be going through an extremely and excruciatingly painful experience from this point on to the grave. Everybody goes through painful experiences. You know, there's a saying out there that goes like this. It says to be kind to everyone, for people are, could be fighting a battle that you know nothing about. And we give these experiences, these, the stuff that happens to you, we give them different kinds of names. We call them hardships, battles, trials, struggles, marriage. Oh, wait, who wrote that? <laughs> Last edited by Mrs. Lum. Oh. All kidding aside, there may be some of you who, are, who have gone through or are going through an extremely painful experience in your marriage. And let me encourage you, God, God cares about your story and can use that to reach others. And your pain may vary. What may seem to be trivial and trite to one person may be excruciating and unbearable to another. And that person, and that is why we should be kind to one another, because that person could very well be fighting a battle that you and I know nothing about. But listen very, very carefully. The enemy is going to use every tactic in his book, every tactic to take that painful experience and use it to drive you further and further away from God, make you less faithful, make you avoid facing the truth, making you run from him. Ultimately, it would drive you apart from God and your faith in Jesus. And we would give up on faith ourselves and we do the enemy's work for him. But let me be the first to tell you tonight, if you don't know already, you can fill in your next blank, God never wastes a hurt. He never wastes a hurt. He won't waste the pain that you're going through right now, brother. He won't, he won't, he sees the disappointment and the heartbreak that you may be going through right now, sisters. But the key in all of this is that we have to surrender to him. We have to surrender ourselves and surrender our hurts before him. I mean, look at Job. Did you guys, do you guys remember devotions from last week? Job, I mean, he's gone through, how many people have gone through that kind of pain and that kind of loss? He lost all of his source of income and his possessions. He lost all of his immediate family members. He even lost his sense of well-being and health. And broken as he was, he said, Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. What faith. What faith through pain and through, through a painful experience. And God can comfort you and I in that same manner. Write this in the side of your notes somewhere on the margin. Psalm 55, verse 22. It's a keeper. It says to cast your cares upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. And not only will he sustain us, he will use our stories. He will use the stuff that happens to us, the painful stuff. And he will use it to give hope and help to those who are hurting. He will use your story, my story, our testimony to reach others for him through our pain. A testimony simply means we've been there and we survived. So painful experiences. But not only painful experiences God is going to use, fill in your next blank, ministry experiences. Ministry experiences. Let's read the next verse together from Philippians verse 1. Ready? Go. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. I will make this very brief but very important to remember. Some of the greatest experiences that God will use to influence other people through your life will come through ministry experiences. And to sum up ministry, ministry experiences is simply one thing, serving. Serving in the church. Being a part of, being a part of the, the many little gears that make New Hope move. You know, there's something amazing that happens to you and me when we, when we use our time, our talents, our gifts, 
our spiritual growth patterns, our individual styles are designed to share with others about Jesus. And much of it is not necessarily teaching or preaching from a pulpit. It's entirely possible to share Jesus by handing out a bulletin, by guiding people into a parking stall, to clean a bathroom, or to pick up trash outside, or to watch screaming children in the children's ministry. Aren't you glad for the people in our children's ministry? You know, there's even a commandment, a biblical commandment for the children's ministry. Do you know that? You do, right? Thou shalt not kill. <laughs> but, don't tell them I said that. But that's an experience that has an eternal impact. Let me share with you a little bit about my story. It was June in 1995, and if there ever was a DCAT, or, or the, the premiere of a DCAT, it was it, the Doing Church as a Team. You know, Pastor Wayne gave us a, a really encouraging message from the Word and talked about how we should be together as a team, and every person has a place in ministry. And I'm going to read this off because I, I don't want to profane the, the first 10 ministries that we had started out with. We had 10 areas of need, ushers, greeters, sound, lights. Lights was just turning on and off the overhead projector. <laughs> <laughs> Refreshments, set up and take down, parking, prayer, children's church, and music and singing. And, and, and Pastor Wayne had given us an encouragement and said, everybody go and take a table. And there were about 75 of us back in June of 1995 in this embryonic stage of what was to become New Hope Oahu. But everybody went and took a table, one of the 10 tables, except one. Can you guess which one? Parking. Parking. They were lined up at the ushers, and I was going to be an usher, and I noticed that, there were, that the, the gentleman's name was David, was sitting at the table by himself. And, and other, all the other tables had lines. And so I'd gone up to David and said, so, uh, did anybody sign up for parking? He's like, duh, right? I mean, nobody's there. And he's like, oh, no, brother. And I said, so, who is going to do parking for the church? And he had said, me and Jesus. And my response was, and me too. Count me in. That was the first ministry I ever signed up for. And that decision led to my eventual leadership of the parking ministry because David kind of had other things to do on the weekend and had to drop out. We started off with four of us, and in, the period, in a short period of time, we had gotten the ministry from four volunteers up to 40, including some shuttle drivers and parking, and we even had some security personnel. And it was in February, February 2nd, 1999, that Pastor Wayne had extended an offer for me to leave my nets behind figuratively and become part of New Hope Oahu and join the staff. Today, I've been a licensed Foursquare pastor for 11 years. I was ordained. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Last year, for some of you who remember, I was ordained here on this stage uh, in the Foursquare Church. I am in ministry today because of a decision I made 23 years ago to say yes to ministry. So ministry experiences are extremely important to reach others. Part of your design. And not only ministry experiences, but fill in your next blank, number three, Spiritual experiences. Spiritual experiences. Let's read Acts 9, verse 4 together. Ready? Go. And he fell to the ground. Then he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Let me tell you plainly right now. There are some of you here who are super spiritual. That's yeah, super spiritual. Maybe even in your BC days, BC days, that you, you could see things like see ghosts, yeah, and see like spiritual things, or like, have like heebie-jeebies, yeah, have that feeling. And maybe from your past, these things are, are, are part of who you are. I've never seen a ghost, by the way. Maybe it runs from me, I don't know. It doesn't want to, doesn't want to deal with me. Huh? Uh, but some of you have a, have a supernatural experience that, or have experienced something supernatural that is clearly from Jesus clearly from the Holy Spirit, a manifested personal experience just like Paul had on that road to Damascus. Many of us, but not everyone who confesses Jesus Christ will have that kind of experience, however. But they will have the power of the Holy Spirit come upon them and stir up our souls. Now the question is this, not whether or not you will have a spiritual experience because every person who confesses Jesus Christ will have the Holy Spirit poured upon him. Somebody say amen. amen. 
But the question is, how will you respond in that spiritual experience? Because so many want, want the spiritual experience to be kind of touchy-feely and ecstatic and, and kind of like this kind of a tingly feeling. And we, be, we can easily become feeling chasers. But let me tell you that the Holy Spirit can be upon us and we will not feel it. We may not have some kind of a tingly experience, but he will be manifested in each of us in different ways. Listen very carefully. When the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus when he was baptized and came out of the water, it didn't manifest itself in his ability to heal the sick or raise the dead or cast out demonic spirits or feed 5,000 people with the equivalent of a plate lunch. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit on Jesus was that he became a servant to all of mankind. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will come up upon you and I in some of the most mundane and boring and, and lifeless seeming experiences. May I encourage you, when you're in that situation, just lift up your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit also, come, also comes through the fruit of the Spirit. I have, I have experienced or I, I have dealt with people who claim to have had supernatural uh, abilities and they were devoid of compassion. They were, com they were devoid of joy in their life. They were impatient. They had no patience. But there are people who have pretty ordinary people like you and I and they were filled with the fruit of the Spirit, with love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Spiritual experiences. I could tell you more about it, but I'll, I'll save that for another message for another time. So not just in spiritual experiences, but fill in your last blank, educational experiences. Educational experiences. I'm going to kind of hover around this for a little bit before we wrap up tonight. Let me read from you for you from Acts 22. I received my training at the feet of Gamaliel, and I was schooled in the strictest observance of our Father's law. You know, in, the, in this verse, we have Paul here, once called Saul, making his case to preach about Jesus. Just a few chapters before, Saul was out killing and torturing Christians. And here we are, he's being examined by the Pharisees, now, as a, now having his Damascus Road experience with Jesus and now becoming one of his greatest advocates. He's being examined by the Pharisees and Paul is sharing his background, trained at the feet of Gamaliel, schooled in the strictest observance of our Father's law. You know, if Paul were educated in today's system, he would have something similar to this. He would have a PhD in philosophy and humanities. He would have a degree in law, a JD, and he would have a doctor of divinity degree in evangelism and ministry. In other words, Paul would be very well trained. And it was that training that helped Paul reach many, many audiences to share about Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that you and I have to have a rocket science degree or we have to have a doctorate in ministry to, to consider ourselves educated or to have an educational experience. Write Acts 4.13 in your margin somewhere. This was Peter and John and it said the Pharisees had noticed the boldness of Peter and John. And knowing that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were fishermen, they marveled and they recognized them as having been with Jesus. Sometimes it just takes being with Jesus to have that kind of boldness in preaching the gospel. And there's many ways to learn. There's academic pursuit, pursuits. Yeah, that's all good. Many of us have gone that route. There's, a, there's educating yourself in craftsmanship and in trade, using your hands, working hard, the acquiring of skills. There's even street smarts. Some of it call it the college of life and college of living. Double portion, Double portion amen. <laughs> but may I say to you, to never be satisfied with where you are in your learning. May I encourage you. A very, very wise woman, I'll share her name, Dr. Martha Stinton, at our college at Pacific Rim Bible University had told me, Kyle, commit yourself to become a lifelong learner. 
a lifelong learner. You know, when New Hope started in 1995, it was Pastor Wayne's dream to equip, train, and release leaders. Emerging leaders, and not just young emerging leaders out of school, but even older leaders, or someone, some from the marketplace to figuratively leave their nets behind, take up their cross, and follow Jesus. Some, like Paul, left their professions to pursue ministry. I'm one of them. In 1998, he founded Pacific Rim Bible College, or Pacific Rim Bible Institute, a continued learning and training center, and I attended the first classes with the church planters. And over the last 20 years, the names have changed. Pacific Rim Bible Institute, Pacific Rim Bible College, Pacific Rim Christian College, New Hope Christian College, and Pacific Rim Christian University today. And I was a student at every one of those institutions. <laughs> It makes for a very impressive resume. But it's the same school, five names different, yeah? Uh, I'm telling you. <laughs> but I saved and struggled over those 20 years to pay my tuitions. I racked my credit card a couple of times, you know, and, and, and got my loans. And there was lots of study and lots of reading, late nights, and lots and lots of homework, all while being a husband, a father, a working man 50 hours a week, and pursuing ministry. I traveled away from this island for several years and stepped away from school and came back and jumped right back in it again. And I did this for 20 years. And in May, I received my first degree from Pacific Rim Christian University. <laughs> Mind you, it was just a simple two-year associate's degree uh, combined with a lot of credits piled behind it. But I set a new record. I got my two-year degree in 14 years. <laughs> Currently, I'm pursuing my undergraduate degree with my hope to finish graduate school in several years and specialize in servant leadership and be part of the college. So may I say to you, even if you haven't cracked a book in years, try it. Try becoming a lifetime, lifelong learner. God just might be ready to launch something amazing in your life through an educational experience. And you don't have to be in the college. You don't have to be in the college to be a lifelong learner. This midweek itself is extended learning. I like to call the midweek people the extra mile people because the Sunday, the Saturday, Sunday people, awesome. But you guys go the extra mile. The extra mile. May God pour into you with each teacher and each speaker and each time you get together on Wednesday night. So a midweek service. Small groups, one of the best learning tools. I, one, my faith grew by leaps and bounds when I got on a table with five other men and we hashed out our faith together, asked hard questions. We tried our best to get the answers. If not, we went, we went home and studied and went through the scriptures and came back together again week by week by week. A small group, a ministry group. A ministry group is not just a place to serve, but a place to grow. The Levites, when we get together on Friday and after we finish setting up, right? We do our Bible study, somebody shares their devotion, another person shares some food, <laughs> but we get together, a place to grow. Serving groups gain practical experience, but they also cause us to have an educational experience and grow. So you have painful experiences, spiritual experiences, ministry experiences, and educational experiences. All these are part of God's design to take your experiences, the stuff that happens to you, and plug it into your design for ministry, how you're equipped and prepared to serve. You know, I'm going to close tonight with a, a story. I've got to tell you the story. It's the reason why I'm here today. It started with an invitation. Way, way back, way back in the 1990s, 1990, 1991. Not to me, but to my girlfriend. We had been together for a couple years. We had been living together in, in sin and enjoying it. <laughs> we were so far from God, we didn't know the difference. We just went through the usual motions that couples go through. And Kay got the invitation to go to church by her coworker, and her coworker's name is Edith. Edith had said, come to church, come to church, just try it once. And Kay was wanting, was kind of open to the idea of going. And she invited me and said, you, gotta come to, you gotta, wanna come with me to church? And you know, on Sunday, when I was far from God, my bike was my church. My bike was my idol. 
and Kaena Point was my church. I would ride my mountain bike almost every Sunday. And, and, and Kay finally had given in and gone to one church service. In fact, she had told me, can you come with me to church that Sunday? I said, no, I have one of those 100-mile bike rides that go around Honolulu, goes around the, the south, you know, and comes back again. And that's kind of important to me. So why don't you go to church? I'm going to ride my bike, and then you can tell me all about it when we get home. So long story short, I, I did not finish that 100-mile bike ride. I had the worst cramps in my life. <laughs> I collapsed and fell off of my bike. Now, back then, we didn't have cell phones, right? So I had to walk to Sea Life Park and go to the attendant in the booth and said, are you OK? And it's like, do I look OK? And, I, and, I le and because there's no cell phone, I left a message on the phone saying, hey, you got to come pick me up. I hate bike riding. I'm never doing this again. Bye. Click. And, uh, and, and, she went, and I just sat there for a few hours, and she came and picked me up, and I, I took my bike into, apart into pieces and put it in the trunk of the car because I didn't want anybody to know I was riding the bike that day. And, and on the way home from Sea Life Park, she was telling me all about church, what, what a wonderful experience it was, and, I, and that you should come with me next week. I said, I will come with you next week. I think that's a sign. I went with her the next week, and I'm going to just, just describe the experience, the stuff that happened to me in one word. Grace. The greeter at the door had said, I had said, you know, I've been away from church. I'm a backslidden Christian. I've been away over 10 years. The greeter had said, you know, Kyle, God is not interested in what happened to you 10 years ago. He's interested in what's happening to you today, and he's interested in your tomorrow. It was grace. My wife gave her life to Jesus that day, and I rededicated my life to Christ on that day, which happened to be my birthday. We, we, gave, we, we did things God's way. We began the plans to become married and to become a couple or family God's way. We were given a, a couple of counselors, that coaches that, that worked us through named Dan and Carol and Shima. That Christmas, there was a Christmas play. It wasn't at the church that we attended. It was at a, a, at a high school. And we were attending with some of our church people. A homeless guy started coming around and asking people for for, for whatever he could get, money or something. And he began to ask the crowd that I was with. So I went ahead and got like five bucks out of my pocket. And I think I had, my, I don't know if I had an unopened bottle of water. And I said, why don't you come with me? And I'm going to take you over to the side. And, and here you go. Why don't you go and be blessed by, by God, you know, trying to sound spiritual, and, and, and be with God. And then he, he went off. Well, the, the, the people in the church crowd were somewhat touched by that. And Edith was in that crowd. And Edith's friend, her name is Doris, she said, I believe God's called you to the ministry. And I said, I believe God's called me to do dental work, to work in the lab, to my vocation. I enjoy doing what I do. She said, no, I saw the compassion that you have for people and how you, how you just ministered to that man. I said, I was trying to get rid of that man. He's a pest. I work in the dental industry because I could be in a, in a laboratory, in a cubicle, with no one to bother me, because people, you know, they bother me, and, they, and people suck, and I, I kind of like being in this in isolated environment. And Doris just kept going on, I believe God's called you to the ministry. And I said, okay, ah, la, 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 la. <laughs> well, time went by, and at our, at our church, there was a leadership conference, and the, the key speaker was a, na a man named Wayne Cordero. Needless to say, by the end of that conference, my wife and I, my now wife and I, were the first ones up to be prayed for to go into ministry. And time went on, and I eventually had to leave this church that I had been a part of to help Wayne Cordero start a church called New Hope Christian Fellowship in 1995. Years later, I had become a part of the church, involved in ministry like you know, been, be, become part of the church planting school and the, the beginnings of Pacific Rim Bible Institute. My son Daniel was born just a few years before, and he was a, kind of a little toddler kind of guy, and Doris wrote me a card. It was a card to say, you know, it was, thank you for sending, sending me a picture of, of your son Daniel. And she said, I'm so proud of you for answering God's call to ministry in your life. And she gave me a scripture from First Chronicles, and I, I wrote it down so I didn't want to make no mistake when I say this. She said, I, wanna, I want you to hold on to the scripture with your life. Be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God, my God, is with you. 
He will not fail you nor forsake you until all of the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. Doris is long gone. And so is Edith. We call her Grandma Edith. By the way, let me tell you who they are. Doris Egusa was the best friend of Grandma Edith. Grandma Edith is Grandma Edith Furushima, Dr. Randy's mom. Is God good or what? What's your story? There's a, there's a latent story in each of you waiting to be told, not just for the completion of this design series, but for the purposes of God, to reach people for Him. Remember, everybody has a story. Your story matters to God. And for those of us who are going to be open and transparent to Him, and to surrender ourselves, to surrender our stories, to surrender our pain, our, back, our educational backgrounds, our ministry struggles. To those who submit to the Lord, He can use your story to encourage and reach others, to become real in their life and bring more people to Jesus. He will use your experiences and use these to shape you to discover how you're designed to be used by God so that you and I can serve him with all the joy and all of the effectiveness that he calls us to, and that is good news. Amen? Amen. I'm done. God bless you. Amen.